Tonight, I'm confronting one of Britain's biggest taboos. There's always been the stigma of mental illness. We go back to the witch burning. I have clinical depression, which I never told anybody about until a couple of years ago. I uh, recently became a poster girl for mental illness. Yeah, it was, a, it was a career choice. I'm gonna show you where I got help, at the Priory. Oh yeah, this is the way. Nope. <laughs> Coming clean about my condition has really helped me. God, when I was here, I was so not in this condition. But most people suffer in silence, particularly at work. Now, I wanna support three people as they risk their careers by telling their colleagues about their mental illness. I've tweeted, are you successful in your business? and suffering from mental illness, would you talk about it on television? It took me a really long time to find anyone prepared to be open. Then 28-year-old Charlotte Fantelli responded to my tweet. She's a successful entrepreneur and has OCD. I probably wash my hands 25 times a day. And there was a time I did it about 60 to 100. See, squeaky clean. Ah, it's a good sign. And I found design engineer Derek, who's 30 and has depression like me you think the best thing for you to do is get away from everybody and not put them through what you're going through. Service, please. Finally, I met Johnny, a great chef who loves running his own restaurant, but recently committed TV Harry Carey. The Great British Menu was the turning point for me. I thought I was going to win. Johnny felt he totally let himself down, which triggered a breakdown. Well, I thought about suicide and I would do it. Fuck it, idiot. But one in five people lose their jobs when their bosses discover they have mental health problems. So is it madness to speak out? Um, Derek Yor, could you come up here? Find out what happens when Derek, Charlotte, and Johnny tell all. Service, please. Can I just say, they're very good breasts, and I need the name of whoever did those because something horrible has happened. I made my name by getting very close to very famous people. 34D. 34C. Look at mine. This is what happens after childbirth. I should be your warning. I am the warning on the cigarette packet. Do not have children. Your breasts will leave you and try to run away. But even though they were opening up to me, I always kept it under wraps that I suffered from depression. Am I doing this right? It's the same walk. I didn't say anything. Because if people know that you have depression, they won't employ you. When I look back, I think my episodes of depression probably started when I was a teenager. I grew up in the beautiful suburb of Evanston, Illinois. There's my dream parents. I was their pride and joy. My dad, Edward, had set up his own sausage business. A vehicle my dad used to come home in, that didn't help. We didn't even know what mental illness was, but as a kid, something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. I remember incidents in shops where she would scream like an animal because I wanted a dress instead of a pair of shoes. If you pushed out somebody too much, they will get ill. And that, combined with genes, is how you get depression. And that might be what happened to me. Then about 15, uh, you can tell something went wrong. I mean, that's the life gone out. You know, people say, how can you tell if something's wrong with your kid? You just look at their face. My parents fled from Europe because of World War II, but as soon as I could, I fled back. By 1986, I was performing in Girls on Top, and the director was Ed Bai. As the days would go on, she'd get more and more glamorous. And then her breast changed size as well. It's enormous. At one stage, she actually, her breast came in the room before she did. And um, they were obviously false. And I knew that she liked me then because as Dawn French was waving the false boobs at me, Ruby was in front trying to do this, trying to stop me from seeing them. And then she took them outside and buried them in a communal garden. He was really normal. And so I thought, I'll need those genes. So I married him for that. When Ed met my parents, it dawned on him why I might have depression. They were awful. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They were awful. Even for me, they were really tricky to deal with. Um, they were just basically incredibly damaged people. This is the mythical Priory, which looks like the castle of your dreams. 
this is really the high end of having mental illness. The first time I was admitted here, I tried to drive here alone. I have no memory of getting here. I remember I ended up in a, um, in a bedding shop and they knew something was wrong with me because I was holding a toothbrush in my pajamas. It, it really gets it here. This, like, it smells like security, kind of like a baby's head. Oh, here it is. It's like um, baby powder. Can you smell it? It's sweet. They sort of redecorate it, but right around here it starts to get really warm and it's like entering, to me it was like entering a womb. <sighs> now we're going up to the attics floor. The attics are up here. That was just the plain old vanilla depressives. Now there's bars on the, on the windows like you're gonna jump from the first floor. Oh yeah, this is the way. Nope. <laughs> And all the anorexics, um, they left their food there and we used to steal it and then they'd say, thank you. This was my floor. There is no thought. Here I am. I'm Why would you go to the mirror? Why would you brush your teeth? Why would you ever take a shower? So you just sit there and you're a lump. You can't imagine. You cannot imagine what goes on here. It's just madness. It's just like in the old days, you know, where they used to bang their heads on the wall. But now, you know, everybody's wearing nice clothes and but there's no cocktail talk here. There's no crap chatter about the weather or you know where you got your shoes. This is hardcore, straight to the heart conversation, which I adore. God, when I was here, I was so not in this condition. You know, you kind of be like, like this. But now I'm just so normal. I'm really conscious how lucky I was to be able to stay here. Believe me, it was only because I had medical insurance. Yeah, 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 hello. Oh, hi, come on in, this is Ruby's house. A few oh, years ago, I took a job presenting films for a website whilst I was hello. still living at hello. the Priory. Part of the, there is, um, they called and said, did I want to do it? And I said, sure, but I was in here. So I pretended nothing was wrong and then I went home and interviewed people pretending I was normal. My husband would drive me back here, but I wouldn't say I had mental illness. How weird is that? We also hid my depression from our three children. I didn't want the kids to be disturbed by thinking that she was ill, but also you kind of kept it quiet for professional and personal reasons. Say goodbye, Dad. Say goodbye to the camera. We weren't aware at all what, with what was going on because uh, our dad used to sort of lie to us, which I'm a little bit like, but that's, he was protecting us. What's the name of your horse thing? If you're a single mother, you have no choice. If I have a front, a beard like Ed, he can stand in. I don't, why would you scare your kids like that when they're too young? But there's a certain point where um, you say, well, mommy's still mommy, but mommy has a thing. When she did tell us we had depression, I thought, oh, okay, that's when her eyes go like that, that when she's mm -hmm. not as funny, yeah. that's when she has really dark thoughts. Even when I eventually told my family, I never planned to go public because I still felt so much shame. But then I agreed a mental health charity could use my photo. And I thought it would be a tiny little picture. And then I went into the tube station and it was, it was gigantic. And so I, I kind of stood in front of it thinking, oh, well, that's the only one. And then when I went down the tube, there was another one and they were all over London. And I was just mortified because I was worried that I, I would never work again. It was just so clever of her to just embrace that and be like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, whatever, I will be the face then, I'm gonna make a stand. Probably out of panic, I wrote the show. Judith Owen did the music and together we toured mental institutions for over a year. I would like to thank the makers of uh, Lamotrigine, Sertraline and Reboxetine. <laughs> Big thank you. Big thanks. Because without those few simple chemicals, I would not be vertical today. So. It was at the Priory where they knew how to make me the perfect antidepressant cocktail. This was my doctor who saved me. Mark. Mark, can we come in? Do you ever, do you ever think we'd see this day? Hi, Hi Mark. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> thank you. I know, it's not usually like going back to a hotel you once went well, to. Well, come on. I'm just looking at my notes. Is that illegal? There we are, Ruby. That's the first page of your history with me. That's the first time we ever met, December 1993. Visual distortion, anxiety, anxiety. sorrow. Look at all of my medication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my it's, God, um, the whole thing is me? We, could you. we sell this on eBay? You had all the classic symptoms of depression. You know, your mood was obviously down, you were tearful, but almost that, was, that wasn't the most prominent bit. You had total sort of anhedonia. Nothing that you knew normally gave you pleasure or enjoyment was doing so. The physical nature of depression as an illness is so real and yet people don't see it. Um, when I was a neurologist, I used to treat people with various things, including locked-in syndrome. Your only communication with the world is blinking your eyes, nothing else. And those patients loved life, did not wish to die. You see someone with depression, the outside, they've got everything and they want to die. Did I want to kill myself? You certainly had thoughts. I, th I don't think you actually did want to. There was enough of you sort of retaining. Still there. You, but you were very aware of those thoughts. That's, that mental pain is, is more anguishing than physical pain? Oh, it's a thousand times more anguishing. A thousand. F physical pain is as nothing compared to, you know, five minutes with real depression. The illness takes over everything. It takes over all bits of your brain takes over your body, you can measure all kinds of physical changes in people with depression in the body. And yet people say, pull yourself together. Oh yeah. When you're lying in that bed and you can't move, it would be really nice, like Alcoholics Anonymous, to have a buddy to say, don't kill yourself today. Don't kill yourself today, this will pass. Because that's really what helps. At the end of the show, I always say, you can come back after the interval and have a discussion. And the audience always come back. If I've taken my clothes off, they can take their clothes off. And so it's a real, it's a real exchange. At the end of one show, this really kind of tough, you know, northern guy stood up and um, he said, I've been taking antidepressants for the last 10 years and I, <laughs> and I never told my wife. And meanwhile, his wife is sitting next to him like this. I want to get people to speak up, not just in theaters, but in workplaces to really break down the stigma. But first, I need a psychiatrist. I've decided before I talk to other people to be open about their condition, I talk to an expert. So I've gone to Professor Dinesh Bugra, who has more initials after his name than anything I've ever seen. He's an MA, an MSc, an MBBS, an FRCP, a PhD, a P I, I can't even, and now he's even a CB, what? E. E, a CBE. What do you think about me discussing with people uh, that they should open up about their mental illness? I personally believe it's a very good thing to do and I think more people acknowledge and open up about their experiences and their mental illness, better it would be. Do you feel there's a momentum building this time? 30 years ago people talked about the C word, they never talked about cancer and so I think we're getting to that level where there is quite a lot of push for people to acknowledge that A, uh, you know, mental illness is treatable B, um, you know, you can get help, and C, it's not um, going to stop you from doing your job properly. You didn't say about my knighthood. <laughs> your knighthood, your damn You know, that if uh, the fact that I'm doing this, can you just cut that in? I'm so glad he's supporting this idea because most of the people who came to see my show said we got to stop the stigma because this mental illness is the last taboo. So what I've got to do, I've got to find three brave high flyers prepared to speak out. Sorry. So I've tweeted, are you successful in your business and suffering from mental illness? Would you talk about it on television? Oh shoot, I spelled television wrong. I want to try and find three successful business people who actually have the nerve and are brave enough to tell their colleagues that they have mental illness. If I can do that, that would be incredible. Somebody just responded to my tweet. We got somebody called Charlotte for the show. Oh, she's very good looking. I don't think we should use her. Do you see what I mean? 28-year-old Charlotte Fentelli from Dorset is a knockout. She's a driven businesswoman and married with a four-year-old son. My family is my wow. Oh. <laughs> she's the main breadwinner and runs her own online magazine business from home. Charlotte has obsessive compulsive disorder known as OCD. I probably wash my hands 25 times a day. There was a time I did it about 60 to 100. I can feel what I've touched. I can feel the germs on them. See? Squeaky clean. Ah, that's a good sign. 
Charlotte has just been headhunted for a new part-time role as a marketing executive. That means she's got to tackle one of her biggest fears, working in an office alongside new colleagues who know nothing about her condition. It's not just doors. I've never been in here because I wouldn't subject myself to it unless I really had to, and I haven't had to yet. I wouldn't touch that handle on the kettle. The, no, those, those are just a health hazard waiting to happen. <laughs> I have no idea what's inside those cupboards. There could be a new member of staff in there for all I know. I've got no idea. You have to use wipes? Yeah. You keep wipes yeah. in your bag? Or gel, yeah. <laughs> Let's see the wipes. Let's see the wipes. OK. Which, which kind of wipes do you want? Do you want you mean you have a wipes? variation? Yeah. Oh, my god. It's a hygiene thing, then, you've got, <laughs> I guess. Partly, yeah. Mostly. You wear... You wear Disposable gloves? Yeah, only at petrol stations. I was agoraphobic for, for a good few months. I didn't go out at all. So what was going on in your head? Fear? Yeah, a yeah. lot of fear. A lot of fear. I mean, I was having uh, 20, 30 panic attacks a day. I mean, I lived for 15 years of my life in fear. Charlotte confided in me that she was abused as a child. I think more than anything in the world. I just want to be clean. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. However... M I know you'll never feel clean, will you? But I hope someday you will. <laughs> Suffering abuse in childhood can make someone more vulnerable to developing mental health problems. I think it's amazing that considering what she's gone through, Charlotte has agreed to explain her condition to her colleagues. Charlotte is unbelievable because most people wouldn't survive that. So I almost feel like if they dare, you know, treat her badly, or I, I, would, I would take them on because you don't survive something like that. You, you know, God bless her, she still has to clean her hands. And for what happened in her life, I'm surprised she's not out there with a knife. So I, I hope they're good to her, because she can't take any more pain. Most of us are stressed these days. Life is just too hard, it's too fast, it's too full of fear. It would be really good if I could find someone who's working in a highly pressurized environment. Oh, I just think I found the most perfect person on my email. Um, he's a chef, and he runs a really successful restaurant in London, a chef. It doesn't get stressier than that. 42-year-old Johnny Mountain started working in catering at the age of 16 and now has his own restaurant in the heart of Westminster. That's impressive. My life turned around years ago when a man came up to me and he said, young man, I must say that was the finest food I've ever eaten in my life. This little brain of mine took that on as the greatest affirmation that I've ever had. The English Pig has been open for two years and Johnny employs seven full-time staff. Service, please. The testosterone that's found in a kitchen is unbelievable. It's very machismo, so there isn't time for the delicate things. There isn't time for sensitivity. There isn't time for emotion. The only emotion that is found in a lot of kitchens is fear. <laughs> And Johnny is just as passionate about his family. He and his wife, Mangri, have two children, four-year-old Harry and six-year-old Lily. He's fun, he's loving, he's mad, he's, um, he's crazy. <laughs> like many people, Johnny's reluctant to discuss his mental health problems with his GP. Instead, he's worked really hard over the years to control his moods himself. But a few months ago, he suddenly had a very public breakdown. The Great British Menu was the turning point for me. I thought I was going to win. It was the most innovative dish that I've ever done. And he gave me two out of ten. And I was devastated. My whole world shattered. The minute that that came out of his mouth, everything collapsed. I've spoken about it before, about not being able to breathe and not being able to talk or walk or communicate, and that was exactly what he did. He drew everything out of me. From what was the biggest 
thing that I've been involved in. I walked away from it. It's a well-produced show, and the competitors know the criticism can be tough. That's why Johnny blames himself for publicly losing it. And as I walked out and kicked the doors open, all I saw in front of me was this six-foot picture of me staring down at me on the wall. And I looked at it, fucking, ah, I screamed, and I grabbed hold of the side of it. It was on a Fomex board, a piece of plastic almost. And I remember I snapped it and smashed it and kicked it down the studio. And when I got home, I fell into my wife's arms and cried my eyes out. It just got worse. And the problem is, I'm a clever fellow, I keep telling you, I'm a clever fellow. Well, I thought about suicide and how I would do it. Fucking idiot, I thought about suicide. Such a stupid thing. Now Johnny wants to tell his staff about his recent crash and thoughts of suicide. Unless we share, how the hell is somebody else going to know that you've got a problem? But that's what I want to do with my staff. I know it's like opening up a big wound, really showing that I've got a weak side. Well, I don't think that it's a weakness. To me, it's not a weakness. To me, it's a strength. I can't help but like Johnny. His intentions are good, but given the last time he came on TV, he had a meltdown. I want to make sure he knows what he's doing. How is that going to help your staff by telling them? If I open up to my staff, they will put more trust in me, and therefore they'll be able to open up to me. And if they can open up to me, then you'll get a bond, you'll yeah. get longevity, you'll get honesty. Surely they must have known something wasn't right with you. They always thought I was fucked in the head. You know, that's, I've been known, if you type my name in, it comes up as eccentric or whatever. I'm not eccentric, I'm just wrong. No, you're not. <laughs> you're right, but you've got Anything a mental wrong. problem. Yeah, thanks. So you've met your, your match now with me. Yeah. I know, I've always thought that. Yeah. <laughs> you're my people. Thanks. I'm one of you. Yes, you are. Do we join hands and... <laughs> yeah, we hug now. No, we don't. <laughs> Get off. No. <laughs> Johnny's typical because he's undiagnosed and untreated. Just give me a minute. The charity Mind says that 75% of those with mental illness in the UK currently receive no treatment at all. And then my husband found me, and he took me to the Priory. We had some insurance money, so I could stay for one hour. <laughs> now I'm going to introduce you to the star of the staff here at the Priory. This is the most eccentric man I have ever met in my life. You cannot believe this man. They put him in a mental hospital. It's unbelievable. That he is so, so whacked out. Derek, get ready for this. You know how many women have tried to marry this guy? Derek! Hey! Hey! <laughs> there, you? He, there he is! What a no Hi, There he is! How Look at doing, the. Baby? I love the outfit! I like the tight jeans. Yeah. This is looking, let's do a spin. You know what the that whole looks like. Why. She was there in class. And the whole funny part was she just jumped right into it. Absolutely I no problem. I was a problem. natural. It was a natural. The, the thing of, the nerve of doing salsa when people are like this. This is what made this the class so much fun because you get a lot of this. Coming like this. When it comes in here, you get a lot of English people like this. No, English. I'm being forced. I don't want to do this. They're medicated. And What's wrong with you? Uh, and a little step, little step. Ah, little kick. Right here we go. One, two, three, four. Ah. This is for sick people. This is, this is for people who are ill in the head. But no, these are just awesome. And I tell you what, if anybody's depressed or down or anything like that, you slap these on with a ripped up t-shirt, that mood comes right up. <laughs> He's under the illusion that we feel better after the yellow. <laughs> My next volunteer is a 30-year-old design engineer, also called Derek, who works for Stanley Black & Decker. One of his team's designs has just been nominated for a national award. Wow, what is this thing? It's, it's actually, it's a little vacuum cleaner. Oh my God. Believe it or not. How do you yeah. get... So this is the handle, you lift it up. Oh, how cool. This is perfect for OCD people. And then you hoover? Yeah. 
And then you have to this, be a little person. Yeah, <laughs> your little people can use it. I love it's it. It's ideal for children. It's perfect for um, everybody who's got an obsession with dirt. And then you, so this is really cool. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Derek has depression and suffered a particularly bad episode 12 months ago. From the outside, I guess it would look like I was, you know, the, the luckiest man alive. But actually, it was probably the lowest that I've, I'd ever felt. I just thought that this is what everyone felt like and everyone else seems to get on with it and I just couldn't deal with it. <laughs> it was really hard for his wife, Catherine. You naturally start thinking, have I upset him? Have I done something wrong? You think the best thing for you to do is get away from everybody and not put them through what you're going through. Jump. Yeah. It's really horrible that Dexy would think he should leave. This is horrible. One in 10 people in Britain will experience depression during their lifetimes. Fortunately, Derek found out what was wrong with him, and knowing is part of the cure. To find out that there was something wrong was, was a relief, to be honest, because then you, you, know, you know that it's not right and there's something we can do to fix it. I know so many people like Derek who are so amazingly creative and inventive, and yet they have a mental illness, but, but they can still do this. So I don't understand why, just because you have something wrong, once in a while, they should stop you from, you know, work or, you know, or, or there should even be a stigma because this guy, you know, is in the design museum and it's, it's won an award. It's really not, it's not right. Derek's bosses have been very supportive. He had four weeks off, but when he went back to work, he didn't tell his colleagues. He's worried about how they'll react and if he'll still feel part of the team. I think Derek's a really great guy. You know, I really like him and so unbelievably brave. But I'm kind of worried because, um, you know, he's his family's only breadwinner. You know, it seems like every week another celebrity is coming out with mental illness. At least it makes you aware, but you know, how are we gonna break the stigma? We need everybody coming out. So, I'm supporting three high flyers who wanna tell their work colleagues about their mental conditions. Today, chef and restaurant owner Johnny is planning to sit down with his staff and tell them about his recent breakdown. I built these doors especially to open out like this. It's part of breaking down that barrier, isn't it? It's all about letting everybody see what it's all about. It smells beautiful, though. By talking to his staff about how he reached crisis point, he hopes they'll be able to come to him with their problems. Alan, Tommy. Come over here, big boy. I've got something to tell you. What time you turn up, Ernie? Nine o'clock. Ten. I've got this quiet side that I've never felt that I could share before. And this thing that happened to me recently, after the competition, it knocked me for six so much so that I wanted to sell my businesses, I wanted to get away, I just wanted to run away. And it was really difficult and I, I genuinely, I contemplated suicide. But I tell you what, from now on we're going to start sharing, okay? I guarantee you one thing, if you share it, it'll start to cool down and calm down and the problem, I guarantee a problem shared is a problem halved. And that's what it is, all right? Fucking shit food bag. <laughs> <laughs> she was huge. For a lot of people probably it's quite a sort of personal private thing that they wouldn't share with anyone at work but you know, it's something that is necessary sometimes isn't it to stop yourself from kind of boiling over. It's hard to see jo Johnny Mountain, you know, the mountain, in, in such a position. But it's—I mean, I guess I got to—I got to give my hat to him. Like he—he—he he, he went there that that far emotionally, but he pulled himself back. I might have exposed myself almost like my retriever lies on his back, exposing everything, and that's showing trust to me, and that's what I've shown to my staff. Well, Johnny's done what he set out to do. His staff really respect him and, and they feel really relieved because now they feel maybe if they had something wrong, they could say it. 
I've noticed people feel so much better when they come clean about their mental illness. And there's no reason to be ashamed because some really incredible people have had it too. It's so unbelievable. Churchill, who obviously had a lot on his mind, was running a country, suffered from depression, which he called the black dog. He used to say that whenever a train went by, he felt he had to stand back behind a pillar. I mean, that really is a description of depression. It's amazing to me that this guy was the hero of World War II, and yet he suffered. So it shows, you know, you could do both. Desperation, run a country. Tackling discrimination against those with mental illness has definitely not been on the House of Commons agenda until now. Dr. Sarah Williston. MP Dr. Sarah Williston recently spoke publicly about her depression in a bid to change the law. I also have experience of severe depression, um, having at the happiest time in my life um, experienced an episode of uh, postnatal depression. So I know what it's like, um, and I'm sure there are many other members of this house and, and listening and following this debate today who will know exactly what it feels like to feel that your family would genuinely be better off without you. I didn't do anything in my house, did I? What exactly are you trying to change now? Well, basically, if you've been sectioned under the Mental Health Act for more than six months, you can't be a company director, you can't be an MP, you can't be a school governor. That can't be right. Um, so all sorts of professions and jobs are barred to you just because you've had what I regard as being a normal experience as part of life. You can have anything else for six months and you're allowed back but mental illness? Well, it's all sorts of things. I mean, you could have been in prison and come back, but, you know, you yeah. couldn't. You couldn't it's uh, archaic. Uh, it's, it's archaic. It's got to go. So prejudice against those with mental illness is currently written into the law. No wonder there's a stigma. Former Defense Minister Kevin Jones is also taking a stand. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to throw my notes away because uh, I've thought very long and hard about this. Um, it's to actually talk about my own mental health problems. That's the first time I've ever spoken to it. Some in my family, what I'm saying today, don't actually know about what I'm going to say. Um, because, like a lot of men, what you do is try and deal with it yourself. You don't talk to people. And I just hope you realise, Mr. Speaker, what I'm saying is very difficult for me now. We're also, I think, designed to think that somehow that if you admit fault or fealty, you're going to be, uh, you know, looked upon in a disparaging way in terms of both the electorate, but also your peers as well. That clearly took real guts, especially because he used to be a defense minister, which must be about as stressful as any job can get. I like him already. And as luck would have it, he just happens to be Derek's constituency MP. Hi. Hi, Ruby. Hi. What do I nice call you? Kevin. Kevin, yeah. hi. This is Derek. Hi, Derek. Hi, Kevin. Thanks nice to meet a lot Take a pew. Yes. I want Derek to talk yeah. to him as he decides whether to follow in his footsteps. So have there been any negative experiences since you spoke out? No, it's been overwhelmingly positive, but if there are, do I care? No, I don't really. We're not looking for sympathy. No. Uh, you know, we're looking for understanding about the uh, situation. But, you know, if, if people take a negative view, I think it's their loss. I guess the, the biggest things that I'm worried about is people treating me differently and also not being given the opportunity to do the work that I can do. Yeah, but that, I think part of you proving that is actually just doing your job that you did before. You're no different from when you, before you actually told people you've got depression. So, you know, what's the difference? Most people will not change their opinion of you. Like Derek, Charlotte's also thinking about how her colleagues will respond when she tells them about her condition. This all seemed really great on paper, and now I just don't want to do it. She has her own online publishing business, which supports other people with mental problems. But now she's also taken on a role as marketing exec for a technology company, and she wants to tell her new colleagues about her OCD. Starting a new job, obviously you want everyone to see your positives. I don't want them to think will affect the way I do my job. I don't want their pity. I don't want them to change the way they see me. I get up, I put the mask on, I come to work, and that's the person I want to be. And now I'm going to take that mask off, and it's really scary. Excellent, I'm here to see you. Sean. Is that Lovely, thank Just you. Just gone around. I don't know, I'm massively nervous. I didn't think I would be nervous. 
As part of her new role, Charlotte's in charge of a big product launch party. What her colleagues don't know is that she finds it difficult to shake hands with strangers, and she thinks canopies are germ-ridden. The reason why people are filming today is because um, I suffer with OCD. The reasons why um, I don't sort of perhaps shake hands or <laughs> open doors and do that sort of thing. So it's an aspect of my life that yeah. I, I don't want to have to hide or feel ashamed of. You all know that I work in mental health as well. Yeah. Sure. But did you think that was just a sort of profession rather than a... But I didn't yeah. really think it was OCD, I didn't know. Oh, right. We are now all aware and yeah. we're not going to treat you any differently, yeah. of course not, but we just, yeah. it's just something we yeah. need to be aware of. Can I ask a really, probably, immature question? Go on, then. If I came around your house and opened your kitchen cupboards... Yeah. Would all the beans and stuff be lined up? Oh, bless you. No. 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 It's a different kind of OCD. That mm -hmm. is that is a, a perception. Yeah. Um, for me, it takes the form of contamination and germs. Uh huh. It's really hard to believe. You know, you see Charlotte and you think, God, she has everything. You know, she's really good looking, and she has a great job and a great husband. And then underneath it, there's all that abuse. It, it always takes me by surprise. When I caught up with Charlotte, it was clear that telling her colleagues had left her feeling relieved. I do. I look really nervous. Look at my eyes. I look like a rabbit in the headlights. No, you don't. Your hair looks nervous. <laughs> what I found with their reaction is it kind of made them understand. I can come across as quite a hard cow. You know, I want people to open doors for me. I won't drink stuff. You know, I, I suppose in yeah, but, a way. Yeah. He now, he now understands that, you know, I'm not being And nasty. you thought he wouldn't respect you. He maybe, he, yeah. he not only respects you, but he really likes you. Oh, bless him. Look at him. <laughs> what are you saying there? God help me. <laughs> are you saying up. that? <laughs> Let's hope Charlotte's colleagues support her during the big launch party. In Durham, Derek is still deciding if it's a good idea to tell his workmates about his depression. One of the big problems caused by stigma is that because nobody talks about it, people can't find out about treatments that work. No wonder suicide is the biggest killer of men under 35. Uh, part of the disease, let me tell you, is when you start getting voices that are quite negative, and you know those voices, I'm an idiot because I went, why did I screw up yesterday? I should have made that phone call. I didn't do, you don't get anywhere. The only way that I'm living life with clinical depression is because I'll hear the pitter-patter early so that I can do things to make it not so agonizing. I'm here studying for an MA in the latest treatments for depression here at Oxford University. I've brought Derek to meet one of my teachers, Professor Mark Williams. In depression, what we see is the mind doing the best it can to try to solve a problem, except it's solving it by trying to think its way through. And often in life, that's exactly what we need. It's just we've had so much training in thinking and using our heads for things that the mind doesn't know what to do right. when the thinking actually doesn't work anymore. It just redoubles its effort to think over thinking. Yeah. Um. What I've learned is that no, by being really aware of my thoughts and feelings, I get early warnings when I'm heading towards stress or depression, and then I can take action. And noticing what's going through your mind right now. Mark is one of the people who has developed a treatment for depression called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. The results are so incredible, it's now being prescribed on the NHS. What it is is a form of mental training that allows people to recognize their thinking. Gathering your attention and focusing it on the sensations of the breath, allowing the eyes to open. I wonder how Derek is doing about opening up to his work colleagues. I think if it wasn't for someone opening up to me, then I might never have even known that I had depression. So it's gonna be difficult, but I think it's the right thing to do, to tell. To, to tell. tell. To hopefully help anyone else that is either suffering now or, or may, might do in the future. I really like Derek. I mean, who couldn't like him? And I really love the fact he's doing it to help other people. I, it's so courageous. <laughs> Meanwhile in Dorset, 
Charlotte's product launch party is about to start. Thank you very, very much for coming to our wonderful launch party. Um, we are this evening launching a fantastic new product. We hope that you all enjoy the evening. The night of the launch party was genuinely a wonderful night because my team around me knew the difficulties I faced and were there to support me. Telling them was the best thing that I could have done. I think it's almost like a stone's been lifted because you carry that and you always think, what's that other person going to say? How are they going to judge me? Am I, am I different from them? But she's told us and we accept it, don't we? I think she's been brilliant and uh, we're quite mindful that she's not going to shake everybody's hand, although I think I have seen her do a few handshakes. So what started as an accident by me becoming the poster girl for mental illness has snowballed. This is where we are so far. Can everybody see? I didn't set out to say I'm going to write a, I make a joke, a show so that I can be the, you know, our saint of mental illness. People started to talk to me in the audience and say I'm bereft, I don't know what to do, I don't know what I'm, medication is. These are my people. I feel at home with them because we understand each other. We can talk treatments, drugs, and how hard it is to get out of bed. There are one in four of us with mental illness, but the numbers are mounting. The achievement I'm most proud of is what I've done at home. One thing I want to accomplish in my life that I wouldn't hand it down. And so I really consciously did this. And the fact that I accomplished it is probably the greatest thing I've ever done. When I cut into the pancake, flour went into my face. <laughs> Go Mom, we're really supportive. She's so devoted to this. The flour's not supposed to come out. No, no, it's not meant to. I'm most proud of her for this because she is doing something she really cares about. I know my mom wishes she wasn't mentally ill, but I said to her, like, I think that it makes you who you are. And without you. this thing, you wouldn't be sitting Okay, yeah, she's mom. horribly cocky today. <laughs> horribly cocky. That's just... That well, like, who are you? Without me pushing, nobody would be standing. Be quiet now. <laughs> it's true. Hi, Hi. One, two. Is this sound okay? I can't believe it's actually tonight. I'm a bit nervous now. I've come to Derek's local pub in Durham. He's invited all his colleagues to have a drink after work, and I'm going to perform part of my show. Ruby being here is fantastic. I never thought that she'd come up to the Northeast. After seeing Ruby's show and seeing what she's done, I was really inspired and felt that this was a good way for me to get my experiences out so other people could benefit from them. I hope he pulls it off. I hope he doesn't faint <laughs> with anxiety. I think he'll be okay. He's a cool guy. Please put your hands together for Ruby. What I did was I toured for the year and a half and I went to mental institutions. The bipolar people used to come up to me and they'd go, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> I'm nervous about telling people, especially on such a big scale, because you don't know how other people are, are going to react. It is an invisible illness to anybody else. There will be people that don't understand. So here's my question. How come every other organ in your body can get sick and you get sympathy except the brain? There's um, someone else in this room that would like to share their story with you. This is very hard for him, but I'd like to bring him up now. So um, Derek Muir, could you come up here? Could you come up? <laughs> So, uh, Derek would like to tell you why he took time off. Um, so, I'm going to hand the microphone over to him. Okay? Thank you, Derek. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. I don't know if anyone has noticed a change in me since in the last year. Um, if you have, it's because I found out that I had depression and I've been lucky enough to catch it early and do something about it. The problem is, if you don't know there's anything wrong, you don't know that there's something to fix. And I didn't know until someone 
pointed out and mentioned their experiences to me and I identified with them um, and that was really the first step. So the reason why I wanted to tell everyone is because talking about it and knowing that other people feel the same way is the key to getting over it. So, so that's why I'm doing this. I sat next to Derek for about 18 months or something, would you say? And I obviously had never, uh, never actually had any inkling, so he's very good at hiding it. <laughs> but I don't think any different of him. Did you know he was going to tell everybody? Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know he was going to stand at the front. That's <laughs> impressive. I'd like to say I'm really proud of him. I think it went well. I'm glad I did it. Hopefully this will have done something for other people. Cheers, Derek. Sorry Thank you. <laughs> Is it warm in here or is it just me? <laughs> I didn't feel it was brave. Someone was brave who talked to me, so I'm just repaying that favour. Give me a hug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think by me letting go to my lovely people that work with me, I now know that that will give them the opportunity to let go to me. And then I will be able to help them, whatever it is. People think that you are weak because you have a mental health problem. Most of the people I've ever met who have a mental health problem are some of the strongest people I've ever known. You know, they're your doctor, your lawyer, your cleaner, your friend. We are changing the world. We are changing nappies. We are writing business plans and we are making a difference. <laughs> the people in this show are braver than I ever was. I never would have told anybody what a thing they're doing. I take my hat off to them. You have to be really brave to admit something's wrong, but the more people that do, the more chance we have of breaking the stigma.